All right, feel free to get started. Okay, so I can start it now, right? Hi, and welcome to tonight's opening panel of Bound International Virtual Performance Festival, originally from China, making of a new theater maker identity. Uh, my name is Tian Ding He. I'm the artistic director of Bound Festival, and it's my pleasure to be in conversation with four theater makers that are not only my friends, but truly people I admire and look up to in this industry. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit more about Bound. So uh, the premises of our work and why we are gathering today to open up the whole festival virtually this year. Bound has been a virtual stage of new and bold reimaginations of pandemic time theater around the world. And this year we have commissioned eight Chinese artists living in different parts of the world to create a new monodrama and to manifest our, uh, what our individual voices are like on the backdrop of the pandemic times and stop Asian hate. And uh, rooting that in the American theater landscape, there is a small group of us out there with bios that start with originally from China. Some of us find it unique and some may find it leads to some undesired stereotypes but most of the time we rush to connect and hold hands with each other to celebrate what this identity has brought to our artistic career. Uh, what does originally from China hold for the lives of generations of theater makers? How did we find ourselves in the unique set of challenges, conversations, and ultimately liberated out as artists and their such identity? This is a conversation that we have never had before and definitely not the last we will have. So uh, I really want to warmly welcome all the artists we have. Now we have invited So Chong Ren Fan. Uh, he is the artistic director of Yangtze Repertory Theater of America and also a very uh, talented uh, independent theater direct director and uh, Xia Ran, uh, Ran Xia. So uh, Xia Ran is a playwright, director, and artistic director of the Arctic Group. And Ming Hao, uh, Ming Hao too. Ming Hao is a playwright uh, and also uh, working on different projects uh, now, uh, especially commissioned by Pipeline uh, Play Lab. Uh, and Xiao Yue Zhang, Xiao Yue is uh, the Producer, a producer of the Archer, Archer project. And I will be the moderator tonight. So uh, firstly, I really want uh, everyone to give our audience a brief introduction of yourself, like who you are, where are you originally from, and what kinds of creative practices have you been working on? Mm. Like on my screen, uh, Ryan is the first. Do you want to start? Sure. Hi, my name is Xia Ren. I'm originally from Shanghai, China. Um, I am a playwright, director, and sound designer. I work independently, but I'm a resident director at The Tank. Um, and I work with Exquisite Corpse Company, which is a interdisciplinary theater company that's based in Brooklyn quite a lot as well. Um, that's it. That's all I got to say, right? All right. Yes. And I know Chongren is also from Shanghai. So do you want to take on it? <laughs> sure. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Chongren. Uh, I'm also originally from Shanghai. Uh, I started doing theater in college, really, um, and mostly musical at the very beginning in China. And then, like, you know, after I moved to the United States, um, my work has been focusing on uh, new works uh, for like, you know, as a lot of us uh, do in New York. Um, and currently I'm the artistic director of Yonsei Repertory Theater. And I'm also uh, a resident artist and producing associate at uh, Pan-Asian Repertory Theater. Great. And uh, maybe Xiao Yue. Hi, um, I'm Xiao Yu. I am from Yunnan and Guangzhou, um, China. 
Um, I, I am a creative producer, production manager, and also director, um, performer. I am a theater hybridity. Um, and uh, originally started working in dance theater. And um, right now I also work independently in uh, interdisciplinary performance. And um, outside of my independent work, I am an associate producer at the Orchard Project based in New York. So Xiaoyue now like currently is here in the West Coast, right? In LA? Yes, I'm um, in LA, Echo Park, LA. Yeah. Uh, and Ming Hao. Oh, hi. Uh, hi, I'm Ming Hao too. And uh, I'm originally from uh, Wuhan, China. And I'm a playwright and I make plays. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I just collaborated with Chong Ren on a, um, part, uh, like a short YouTube play that's um, uh, commissioned by his company and it's uh, gonna be an ad like a loose adaptation of uh, from, from like a story from Liao Zhai. Yes, I also like very glad I'm kind of part of the process of their incubation. So I think we can talk about it later because I also really, I think it's a really important project and we can discuss about it. Yeah. So um, I'm actually really curious, like how did you find your, your interest in theater and how did you land in American theater? Yeah, it, it, does anyone have a strong uh, interest to answer me about that? Because I think maybe not all of us like were majored in theater in college, but it doesn't really matter, like, yeah. I have one of those experiences, like how we Chinese people say "ban lu chu jia," which means you change career, you ditch your money making future to do arts. Because I studied psychology and I went to grad school for communications and media studies for years, and then right after graduating from grad school, I wrote a play, decided to go into theater full time. And then here we are. But I think I initially got my interest in theater probably when I was even just in primary school or middle school. I remember reading the very first uh, dramatic text, and it was Timon of Athens, Chinese translation. Um, it was weird, it's a weird introduction to Shakespeare. And then after that, I just started getting that taste of consuming dramatic arts, having my parents buy me all of the plays. So, um, but I never thought I was actually gonna make a career out of it, but really glad we're here today. Yeah, I kind of just want to continue because uh, there are so many uh, pe people, Chinese artists, uh, they may not finally or like currently land or stay in America. And I'm wondering like, and like how, uh, how do you want to stay here in America to be a theater maker? Oh, me? I'm, yeah. I'm going for the long haul struggle of renewing my old visa once every three years, which I'm just starting to do that and spend every last penny of my income on my legal fees. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is like a very primary struggle for mostly yeah. all the Chinese, the artists from China and also other countries. Yeah, so uh, what about um, the rest of you three? <laughs> How do you like uh, land in theater and started to do theater? Maybe and can you introduce a little bit about it before? I can, I can go. Uh, I did not come from uh, like any uh, kind of uh, like art background. Like, you know, the, uh, I remember uh, when I was like eight years old or 10 years old, there was a TV show in China called Dongfang Yingxiong Hao Shao Nian. And it was like, you know, re, 
re uh, reenacting the old like you know tales uh, from like you know how to be a good kid or something. And I remember like my parents really like you know my parents are pretty liberal and uh, they wanted me to like you know uh, to audition for that show. And I remember like I was crying so hard. And I was like, there was like a table in our living room and I was literally underneath the table and I was holding the leg and I refused. So that didn't go well. Um, and then like, you know, for the rest of the, um, you know, middle school, high school, college, you know, I really loved singing. So like, and I always uh, like, you know, enter any kind of like singing competition, like, you know, here and there, but that, that was about it. And um, I don't think I had a very, clear path as what I wanted to do. Um, so like, and I just went along with like whatever was happening to me. Um, and freshman in college, I remember like I felt very lost. I went to uh, Shanghai International Studies University and I was majoring in English uh, literature. And uh, I like, I, I just felt lost because like, you know, the whole, you know, a lot of the Chinese kids your whole life uh, was to study hard and to um to like go to a good university and then like you know that was the the only thing i feel like at least my generation i don't know like what's going on with the millennials um but you know the that was the, that was about it that was the end of like you know the whole life planning and then in uh in college of course like you know, there were a lot of you know self-awareness of like you know who i am what i want um, and I just met this uh, group of amazing uh, people. Um, none of them came, like you know, came from um, you know, like a long like a theater, his like the background as well. Um, so we just started, like you know, somehow we all loved singing, and so we started doing musicals. Uh, we did uh, my first uh, musical on campus was uh, Rent, uh, and then later on, like you know, as like after the first, um, like I would say like 16 months of my life, um, I took over the musical theater club on campus and uh, I acted and I directed uh, in the first, I would say like the first public performed version of Spring Awakening uh, in China. That was like very early, it was like 2010, that that was the first performance. And then like, you know, so, so like, you know, suddenly I realized, shit, I, had not interned anywhere. A lot of my friends were interning with those like, you know, uh, Fortune 500 companies and, you know, they were preparing themselves for uh, like, you know, going to like the career, like, you know, or like becoming an adult. And I just felt like, you know, I still feel, felt like a kid, but I was so happy. Um, that's when I decided to look for grad school. Uh, and particularly because back then my only interest was in musical. So like, you know, it, like you know, even these days, like, you know, Chinese musical or like Asian musicals are not, like the industry itself is not as uh, uh, like, you know, well put together. Uh, there are a lot of, in, you know, infant structure problem. There are a lot of ways like in front of production to the you know, creative process, there are a lot of issues and, and it's, it's gonna take generations to change. So. I was talking, I told my uh, folks, I said, if I uh, ever got enrolled in a, uh, in a uh, program and uh, I would just, you know, I would pick this as my career and I would focus on this only. And if I didn't get enrolled in any program, then like I would give up this crazy idea and become like a norm, like quote unquote normal person. <laughs> But then like, you know, my uh, grad school actually gave me, and then my mentor was looking for somebody like more like a, a piece of blank paper rather than like somebody who's like, you know, have, uh, who, who's had a lot of experience. Um, and I was very lucky to, uh, to you know, come here, by, you know, in the end. And well, like then the career struggle and all of that, you know, that's a long story. And like, you know, almost 10 years later, I'm still here and I'm still creating works. and. Um, I've been meeting a lot of amazing people, um, and I'm very grateful. Thank you for sharing like so much memorable, uh, memorable experience with us. Yeah, and I know Xiaoyu and Minghao both went to school in the West Coast, 
So maybe your experience is different from like where people go to East Coast schools. So <laughs> yeah, would you like to share some stories and how did you find yourself in theater, in American theater specifically? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can start. Yeah, um, definitely. I was not thinking, planning uh, to come to West Coast for theater. Actually, all other schools I applied was in New York or East Coast, but then landed um, at CalArts was a life surprise. Um, so I felt theater not uh, strictly theater of play or like language. Uh, driven performance, but theater in general, like being in the physical theater, has uh, just been around all my life. Um, I studied um, traditional dance, tra traditional Chinese dance, and um, ethnic dance since I was four. So, like performance and being um, being in around performance area, and also um, in a way producing performance without knowing that was actually producing. Uh, so that has all, always been happening. And um, I actually studied filmmaking for my undergrad, but parallel to that, I um, started having a very close, um, intimate relationship with a, um, a dance studio in Guangzhou called Argao Dance um, Performance Group. So I felt um, in parallel to my study um, in undergrad, um, contemporary dance and also other performance language for me was opening up a way of body liberation and also just like a human liberation I've never enc encountered before um, and that just drew me very strongly and really also my parents um, I was very fortunate that my parents weren't trying to put a lot of career pressure on me but allowed me to explore step by step um, they always had um, blind trust in me um, of figuring out what I want to do with my life. Um, so um, I started working um, with the dance theater in um, also a very hybrid capacity. And I happened to have a touring uh, coordinator job um, with a company in Shanghai. So that job, um, straight out of college, uh, gave me an experience to um, encounter like major theaters in 19 cities in China. So like um, Baoli Theater and all, um, I would say the equivalent of regional theaters um, that exists in China. And also just encounter like how theater system operate, how um, Mm, the infrastructure, I think, and the infrastructure and the system of theater as a um, um, forming industry in China. And I had a lot of, I saw so many in exciting things and also had a lot of question of, um, because I was a touring production. So at the same time, I was learning about how theater operates in foreign cultures and foreign countries. Um, so by ex experiencing that clash, Sometimes collaboration and sometimes clash uh, make me feel I do want to know more um, about how um, how this world is built um, inside out um, of the theater. So I had two choices if I wanted to apply for a more um, making program, so, so like directing or performance or uh, producing a management program. And at that moment, just like um, I felt the tour gave me such a strong impact, and I felt this is some this is a place that I want to start. Um, so I was looking at our program, um, and um, actually came here to visit all the um, schools that I applied, and I just immediately had a very strong connection with my mentor, my mentor then at CalArts. So, um, like also CalArts is supposed to be um, a place where because we do all. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, we do all school training, um, and it it did gave me a lot of freedom um, to explore and participate and involved in theater making all around. So not just my program solely. So that at that time felt like a great uh, way of studying the whale, almost was like an apprenticeship 
So I came here um, and um, yeah, very fortunate to have um, experience within my program, um, production management and producing, but then also got to be involved in, in projects as a dramaturg as, um, um, and found my uh, community of collaborators um, and we've been still doing collaborative project independently. Great. And uh, so Ming Hao, like, yeah, was how did you get into theater? But I know you are a theater major, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think similar to quite a few others here. I, I, I think it was still like quite by chance that I, I did not go to college. I mean, I went to college in California um, at UCSD and uh, I like when I, apply, when I applied, I wasn't a theater major. I mean, and, and college was uh, a very trying time for me. I mean, and for many others, but for me, definitely. And uh, so I think I was quite lost and I was kind of alone in, in, in another, in, in like, not my home country and then I was uh, really just trying to figure out what I want to do and then um, I switched my major multiple times and uh, so so yeah so it was I mean I think looking back it may be not may not be a bad experience <laughs> to like really try out a lot of things but at the time it was certainly like hard and um so I think I think it was like totally by chance that like one of the uh beginning like a, a begin at, a, at, the, at the beginning of a semester I um basically went into the wrong classroom and then didn't realize I was in the wrong room for a long time and and that's pretty much how I stumbled upon like a modern drama history class and and it was like a very scholarly class about um uh like mod like the the theater history of um the 20th century and yeah and i thought oh that's actually pretty cool and i don't know what else i want to do or i i can do so i thought i would try this i would try this class and and yeah and after that i like tried a playwriting class um, and it was I, I guess in, in, in a lot of, like it, it's, it's a way for me to like I to uh, that kind of self so like the self uh, expression was I couldn't have uh, I couldn't do like anywhere else and I, yeah and so I think that's Started. Thank you, like everyone, for sharing uh, so much details about your life because I think it's very meaningful uh, to be present and to be known uh, like a very specific person, very uh, different artist. Uh, yeah, so we have already, I think it's very interesting that I observed like all of us because I am also uh, a director and I was not majored in theater before as well. So kind of share a lot of similarities with uh, all that you have said. So, uh, and the first thing I saw is like, uh, we all have very supportive family. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think that's a very good thing because I, I can imagine in a lot of stereotypes uh, like, Chinese parents and families mostly will have a very uh, strong pressure uh, on their kids. But uh, yes, we are still like making arts and be supported by our families. I think that's something uh, we have really appreciated. And we also like want people to know, like I will want people to know that I'm really thankful to my family to support me to do arts. And another thing is uh, we have talked about, we have so many experience in China, uh, which I think in a way to influence us to get into theater and land in the American theater. Uh, I have like a question 
uh, it's what's her relationship between you and uh, China and the Chinese theater industry now? Uh, because I think different people will have totally different um, ideas about it. And also like what to expect in the future. Do you want to just do more concentrated, more um, uh, theater you make in America or you also have some expectation to do something uh, globally or intercontinentally? Uh, yeah. Does anyone want to start? Uh, maybe, yeah, Xiao Yue. <laughs> I feel that's such a great question because I'm sure um, almost all of us um, studying here have encountered that question. I actually was just talking to several of my friends this entire week about um, our choices. I think um, from me, for me, it's very, um, uh, um, you need that. I think from the beginning, I really wanted to pursue um, a hybridity of culture and experience. Um, and for me, being having um, a life in theater or, or my life with theater um, in a fluid way, which means I can always experience from culture to another um, is my ideal way of making work. Um, but at the same time, um, I think throughout this, these years being in US, um, I've also um, had a um, very profound experience of recountering my own culture and my roots, um, my relationship with homeland, while it's a distant re relationship, um, has brought me new intimacy um, with um, my past. So I think um, I encountered this idea of transcultural theater while reading, actually reading a play, uh, reading an, an analysis of uh, of a Chinese, um, French Chinese playwright. And this idea gave me a lot of inspiration of um, we are always going to be in, in mo mobile, in mobility. Um, like right now, comparing to 50 years ago, um, we've already absorbed, like our generation, um, I grew up being heavily in, um, influenced by Western culture. And actually my relationship to, to theater was also uh, mainly influenced by Western style of theater and contemporary dance, which is, was not re originally from China. So um, I think there's cultural, there's also form, there's all these content and philosophy, lifestyle, all kinds of um, um, hybrid um, mode of being that has one is always informing another. Um, I don't know if that actually answers the question, but for me, um, it's not about physically where I'm gonna be, but um, but I think um, my Chinese um, upbringing and the root will always inform my experience, whether I'm in China or outside of China, whether I'm in the US, and also my experience here would always inform my uh, future experience, I think. Yeah, thank you, Xiaoyue. I think that's a very, very good point. Like, because basically being in one place or another is like, it's, yeah, it's totally different from what we read in the history or what is before the internet and also the globalization. Uh, but I mean, maybe we don't know what will happen next because I feel the global globalization situation is changing too. Yeah, so, but I think, I thank you for your sharing of ideas. And uh, I think that's a good start about what kind of intercultural kind of work we have done or some work because I have uh, researched all of your, uh, all, all four of your plays and works you have done before. Like what Minghao said, Chongren and Minghao have done uh, uh, YouTube series uh, is based on Liao uh, Jai, the very classic uh, Chinese stories. 
And actually, I think Xiaoyue uh, also did a project based on Liao Jai before. And I also saw like uh, Ran, you did a Tao, Tao, a Tao uh, play. And I, I imagine there might be some, because I saw Chinese characters and also Chinese, Chinese concept in it. So I think they're all, all very interesting. So does anyone would like to share? And we, we may just have a discussion about how we did it and uh, how we uh, are inspired by what we learned and what, uh, what we have this kind of intercultural identity. So first of all, I kind of want to share my screen with you guys because I, I really want to show the Liao Jai project uh, with uh, all of you and all the audience. Uh, let me do it. So, because I think it's a very in, uh, interesting and uh, intriguing play, uh, a whole series. And I even really love the design of uh, the posters and everything because I can taste a very uh, traditional Chinese, but also like a modernized of it, uh, a very young spirit of all this. So this episodes are uh, all written by uh, Asian uh, playwrights and performed by Asian uh, actors, actresses. Yeah, and uh, Chongren, if you want to talk, like I'll just show my screen and you can just start to talk or me how, yeah. Maybe I will uh, just chat a little bit. So like, you know, I think it's tying actually back to what uh, Xiaoyue was saying, like, you know, the more I think about like, uh, oh, well, like, you know, tending or the question about like, where do you want to uh, work? Like, you know, do you want to work in, like, you know, back home or do you want to keep working here? Um, I've had a variety of different experiences working um, both in China, for Chinese companies in the United States, uh, as well as for uh, like you know, Asian American companies, uh, as well as for like you know, the uh, predominant, uh, predominantly white institutes. And I would say like at this point of my life, uh, what I, my main co focus is really on, uh, because I'm also tied, uh, <laughs> like I'm, I'm like, you know, have very strong bond with uh, the two uh, organizations I'm working with. Uh, so, like, you know, I, my main focus currently is in my work in the United States. Um, I, the intercultural um, element of making theater is, well, like, you know, if any one of you can solve this problem, I would, like, I would say go for it. But I just think it's, uh, at, at least, like, you know, my brain room is not big enough to figure out how to solve that. I actually... I actually think it's not a solvable problem to like, you know, make really the cross-cultural work, um, like, you know, have that much of an impact. Uh, largely, it comes down to who's your audience, right? You know, you write, you know, of course, like, you know, when we create works, like, you know, we come from, um, it, it comes from who we are, like, you know, what, like Miha said, like, you know, the theater is in a way of express yourself. And, uh, but like in the end, you know, isn't that like the saying, like, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, but no one's around, like, into the make a sound, uh, you want people to see it, you want people to know about it. And that way, like, you know, you're not just standing on the street and yelling, and then like, nobody knows what you're talking about. So that really makes me uh, think more and more about, you know, particularly from like an artistic director point of view, like what we are doing. Here um, in 2019, we did a very successful uh, play. It was written by uh, Ilong Liu. Uh, June is the first fall. Uh, that play, um, to me, it was like it, it, it was such a great um, breaking point for uh, both you know my producing partner Sally and I, and for the company. We figured out like you know we want to uh, we want to see the world. We want to produce uh, produce plays to see the world through a Chinese contemporary Chinese lens, uh, but what does that what does that mean? We are still on a journey uh, to figure it out. So when the pandemic hit, uh, of course, all the live theater productions got shut down, and we were actually doing a bilingual play. Uh, it was based on uh, Salzman, uh, the death 
of a salesman. Um, and it, it was postponed and now like, you know, we're looking at to do it next year. Um, and then like, you know, we were like everyone, I know like in particularly if you're still in the States going, you know, we've been going through a very difficult time, both like, you know, physically and mentally. Um, the, so like, you know, I was haunted by a lot of the crazy weird dreams. And uh, immediately I start thinking about like, you know, those nights when I, you know, when I was young, I was sharing a bedroom with my grandfather and he used to uh, read uh, Liao Zhai to me like every night. It was so inappropriate since I was a little kid, but somehow it imprinted this kind of like, you know, you go using a storytelling to, um, to express, there's like a part of you that you cannot really express directly to the public. Um, and so like I had this crazy idea, I started like chatting with people and suddenly I realized a lot of people actually share that similar feeling of not only like, you know, about the pandemic of our struggle, but as well as like, you know, a lot of the, you know, I think most of the writers were so excited because they're, they, they were, you know, they wanted to uh, write something about it. Then it comes to like how to write it. I do not want to, you know, write, uh, because like in our audience, uh, you know, it, it like majority of the audience uh, like are English speakers here. And uh, like, I don't wanna, I, and also there's, if we are not doing it in Chinese, there's no way for us to actually create like, you know, the li uh, like a more literal adaptation of Liao Zhai into like, you know, any kind of format. So the more um, I think about it, the more I realize we need to reflect because like, you know, there are a group of us here and, you know, the, the, the immigrants, the first generation immigrant artists here. And then there are a lot of the struggles personally or like what they are experiencing or like, you know, or what they are seeing their friends are going through. Um, that is more interested, you know, to me. So like, you know, we ask the writers to use uh, the text in the novel as a start, a jumping, you know, like to jump off, like, you know, and to start thinking about like what they can make, uh, but I, we want them to set it in a uh, contemporary um, modern America setting and reflect what they are going through personally into the piece. And I think like, you know, all, everybody did a wonderful job and uh, the, uh, the all, all five episodes will go uh, live on demand uh, from next to Wednesday uh, and then it's free for all. And so like, you know, just like go to uh, yancyrap.org uh, and you can register today and, um, and you can start watching them uh, next Wednesday. And, I'll, and also like everyone is overwhelmed with online content right now. You know, all these pieces are about 20 minutes each episode. So like, you know, you can watch, you know, once like, you know, one episode a day and if you like. Uh, and I think like, you know, that's because that's the, uh, like an you know, attention span I have these days. I, I, I cannot sit in front of my computer to watch like an, an hour show. So I hope like, you know, you will enjoy it. And we'll, we hopefully we can have more discussions about, you know, this in the future. Yes, I, yeah, I'm also like cannot wait to watch it because I, yeah, I, uh, I know the incubation process. And I, I think the plays are one of the best I've seen because I'm curating this online festival to, for two years. And uh, I have to be honest, there are not a lot of very good uh, play online. They may put their hearts in it, but the output may not be very, very good. But uh, I I believe like uh, the Laird series, uh, the Clubhouse, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And from a writer's perspective, uh, I kind of want to ask Ming how, like, uh, how did you uh, manage the bilingual writing in your play? You can maybe talk about it uh, within the Clubhouse series. Um, I think for me, like writing, a, a lot of it is, for, for, I mean, for me is about like to really, about like patterns and, and habits and and really to uh like like we talk about culture and then uh 
East versus West or like China, China versus the US. And I, th I think those are like super urgent, like important topics. But for me, I, I also feel like like even just the word culture of course is no like a definite like like a de definition of the word and for me a lot of it comes down to like basically your behavioral pattern and, and each of us we come from different regions in China and and to to like sometimes the, the cultural differences can be huge too and and each family each like I, I feel like like how I was raised like all the um my parents and those are all my culture and and they're very different and 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 for me that those eventually shows up as like my behavioral patterns and 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 habits and and so i think that's what i always like like to investigate like just knowing my um, learning about my own patterns and, and and breaking my own patterns and I think uh, I think in in that sense like bilingual like like to me is a great way to develop a sense of like self awareness like the non 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 attachment like in non attachment and like defamiliarize yourself from from a, your your like your old patterns and and like yeah. You don't need to like break away from everything, but I feel it's a a joy and for me to like really learn about my own um, patterns and and why I think certain ways. And I I really agree with uh, what Xiao Yue said said about um, uh, developing like a new intimacy with China after I after you've been in the U.S. I, I think it's for me that totally happened i think um for me i i i i feel like having that distance and and like uh it really helps me to have more perspectives on on, on china i think when i was uh in high school in china like how I looked at China was very, very different from how I looked at it right now. I think it's, um, I think now I probably in some way look at it with more different perspectives and somewhere closer to objectivity, if that exists. But I, I feel like I, I, I definitely feel very different about China, about Chinese culture, about my upbringing now because of the distance I have, the, the non-attachment that really helped me. Yeah. I've read Miha's play and I am always um, like very in touch with it because uh, in some way, I think it's interesting, even me how it's uh, writing in English, but I can feel uh, like a kind of freehand brushwork of Chinese classical painting, like called Xie Yi in China, uh, in his English uh, plays. So it's similar to what we have seen of the Liao Jai posters, uh, that kind of uh, brush strokes. Uh, and I can feel that in me how's play. So, uh, and I, I, I'm really interested. Uh, so I think it's very interesting that you find a different freedom and a different perspective as a bilingual writer. Uh, and also I know like uh, Xia Yuan, you also uh, write a lot of things uh, is you read plays, but also uh, critic reviews. Uh, what about your experience being a bilingual uh, writer? Sure. Um... I predominantly write dramatic works in English, actually, because I entered the theater world after coming here to the United States and then made my communities and colleagues within the English speaking world first. So, but um, just to kind of add on the intercultural topic, I think I'm a pathologically optimistic person and I really have a lot of hope 
in creating works that bridge different cultures. And I'm actually really glad that you brought up Tao earlier because I kind of, I forgot about it. And then I remembered that I did that. Um, so Tao in Chinese means peach. And a lot of the Chinese language that I'm interested in has to do with homophones and homonyms. And when we did Dark Fest in, at the Tank Theater a couple of years ago, the idea was to create pieces that does not use electricity. So my collaborator Florence and, I, and myself decided to create something that utilized both of our interests and mythologies across different cultures. So I brought up the, the legend of the, the land of the peach blossom spring, which is Tao Hua Yuan Ji by the Chinese author Tao Yuan Ming. Um, he's ancient, I don't remember what time he was from. Um, that's the one. So Tao is the surname of the author. It also means peach. It also means to escape. So depending on how the character is written, they're all pronounced the same way. And we started talking about how in every single culture there exists a place where people, people's mind would travel to when they are trying to escape a reality that's a little bit too much to suffer. So there is Tao Hua Yuan Zi in Chinese legend. There is Avalon in the Irish culture and a bunch of other types of fantasy land in every single culture. So I think if we as a human could share that hopes and dreams, um, and, and on the other hand, I think in more recent years, I've been sneaking a lot of Chinese mythologies into my work. Most recently, a play that I've developed with Pipeline Theater Company um, in the Play Lab class of 2019 through 2020. Um, one part of the story is based on the legend of the white snake, so Bai Shuo Zhuan in Chinese. And I think, I've become more confident in not trying to explain why I'm including certain legends. Because I think in the Western culture, if you are writing about Greek mythology or if you're writing about you know, Western culture and uh, myths in a piece of pop culture work or a piece of dramatic work, nobody really questions, questions you where it's from. And if people want to know more about it, they can just Google it or look it up. And as a Chinese person, I feel like we, we've always felt the need to justify the use of our own myths and our own culture. And I think it's a part of lineage. It's a part of my lineage that I think I don't have to make excuses to include in my work. Um, so if a bunch of the characters in the Western literature canon can be inspired by Thor and Loki, we can also include characters that are based on Bai Su Jin or, you know, a lot of those, uh, or Guan Yin, lots of those um, deities in Asian culture, uh, because Asian people and Asian American people, there are lots, there are lots of us. So I think there, there could be a greater representation that could represent the reality um, in the pop culture. I'm babbling on a lot, so please stop me. No, you're not. You really made a point. I, I'm quite inspired by what you just said, and also your, you. Uh, the work you have done, uh, no matter it's the white snake one or the uh, Tao, I think after you describe it, because I only saw this poster on your website, but uh, I think I really get a lot of more cultural elements and also the idea based on the cultural identities from it. So if you are doing something like that uh, in the future, please let us know. <laughs> 
Yeah, and uh, Xiaoyue, I also uh, saw you have done a VR chat project uh, and also is in a, a fringe festival. Uh, I can share uh, some images on your website and you can also talk about it because I think it will be a very fascinating discussion, uh, different people and artists doing the similar uh, adaptation of the same uh, story series. Um, sure. Um, so Liao Jai, I can talk about Liao Jai a little bit. I can also talk about because I feel um, some of my work later on could be um, maybe a nice, interesting um, in addition to everybody, uh, what everybody just shared. Um, very briefly, Liao Jai was um, um, uh, was a collaboration with um, a group of artists from U UCLA and USC, uh, directed and adapted by my friend uh, Lu Changting, um, also from CalArts, um, also a theater uh, producer and um, director. Um, it was so it was a process where it was a device, um, a device of theater. And it was where um, this group started to collectively think what uh, sparked um, the inspiration for Pu Songling to write um, um, these ghost um, yao guai um, and um, mystical figures, and what. Um, in relation to a lot of Chinese artists and writers um, in relation to their political status and um, uh, their relationship to writing uh, and, cr and creating work and um, what what are the feelings of being trapped and being um, like the also the power of uh, uh, of um, of these um, creatures that are that are human-like, but they're not the transforming potential of ghost um, metamorphosis. Um, so it was a process where um, it was very interesting for me. Was the first time that we did a play um, about Chinese culture, especially ancient culture, in English, and we were talking about how to make the language accessible, um, how to make these characters, uh, the, a region of these characters accessible to American audience. But I remember the feedback from some of the audience after the show was like, everything was so like, um, there's a layer of um, understanding. There's no need to understand 100% of everything. Um, that's also, I think it's a beauty of transcultural um, or intercultural work um, that is it, it, it draws on something uh, more in common uh, human consciousness that you don't have to understand exactly every word uh, what is referring to um, but I think for me personally in um, bringing Chinese culture root into my own work I think it's just something I um, cannot es escape so far, uh, going back to the distant uh, new intimacy with my culture, with Chinese root. Um, I think there's a lot of relearning about uh, what shaped me and what shaped my in environment um, growing up. So um, where do I start? Because I have so much information in my brain. Um, I don't know which one to pick. But um, so I did uh, last year, not last November, I did um, a work called Little Red Book Dash or Plural Body, um, part of the Red Can You Original Work Festival. And that was a show about um, uh, Chinese bodies movement. So how does the Chinese body move? And what did we learn? Like what did us, our generation learned growing up. What are the the very mechanical, uh, repetitive um, body training that um, we had go th we we went through, and how does that in a way shape our identity individually and also in relation to collective identity? Um, 
I think that started from like that that project was sparked from my、um, sharing a little bit nerdy information of what I was doing、um, at school. So it was coming from a research project about、um, Chinese performance vocabulary since the nineteen fifties since the fifties, and so each decades around each decades. Um, some of those new movement language that were be- being、uh, either engineered or being promoted or being like put on like the spotlight dominant、uh, performance position like um, um, you know the during、uh, the sixties and seventies the uh, model um, revolutionary model opera Yang Ban Xi and then also from the fifties、um, as I learned that Chinese what we Consider as Chinese classical dance, 古典舞 and then ethical eth、uh, ethnic dance, 民族舞 um were actually contemporary product um during that time. So starting from the fifties, and then also Tai Chi. What I thought like the 二十八世 twenty eighth um paradigm Tai Chi that I always thought was the original um、uh, traditional form of Tai Chi was also a Contemporary product, a、uh, a、uh, uh, like a simplified、um, ways to make it more accessible and common for people to practice.、Um, and then you know also the gymnastics that we're all familiar with, eye massage, and then school、uh, military training, junshin, and all that. And just think about how these、uh, body exercise and The way of how a body move were really a new like waves and waves of new in, in invention and new、uh, creation that heavily formed our growing up. How heavily、um, like constitute of what right now we can see、um, how Chinese bodies move, and so、um, and also just. Their knowing their、um, relationship to the larger, the macro conversation of、um, you know Chinese contemporary political identity, and then also knowing that a lot of like Chinese model opera, a revolution of model opera and Chinese dance, classical dance, ethnic dance,、um, the intention of inventing part of the intention of inventing these、uh, new waves of New ways of movement、um, has something to do with the exploration of national identity. So, like, what movement can represent the new identity of China, which is like a fascinating process of knowing that, and that just rewired my brain、uh, in that research process. And、um, so, the work that I was doing last year was、um, about、uh, making connection to uh, these. Um, Movement vocabularies and individually, and unpacking me and other performers, us as a collective, our individual journey,、um, relearning,、um, reaccessing the childhood memory of learning dances and going through military training and going through、uh, gymnastics every morning in high school.、Um, And how does that? I think feel like that was a work where、um, we worked very directly with those symbols, with the symbolistic elements of Chinese identity for us, and also for other culture that constitute the stereotype of Chinese um, um, bodies. We dissect that and just trying to find the physical connection of. Um, set aside those ideological logic, judgment, but then, like, what is it really doing to us? How、uh, was I repeating the same movement every morning at 10 a.m. for three years? What did that do to me? What my body learned, and what、um, did it want me to learn? And then now,、um, I thought I forgot about that, but no, like none of us forgot about that. Uh, muscle memory and somatic experience. So, then now,、um, how do we allow ourselves to have another dialogue with it?
And just sharing like an, an anecdote. Um, one day, because we're uh, during COVID, we're going through individual rehearsal. So there was a filming session at the end where uh, we were creating a green screen um, figure of uh, someone doing the gymnastic high school gymnastic with a headless figure. Um, that also was part of it was coming from um, borrowing Chinese mythical uh, inspiration. So we're filming that. Um, and then as we're chatting, I was as I was chatting with my friends, with my um, um, people who were helping with uh, with the filming, and then the music just started like the二套全国中学生广播体操, and that just started, and then everyone just automatically started to do the gymnastic without saying like, "Hey, we should start." It was just a bizarre experience, and that that was, um, yeah, that was that was something. Um, also blabbering <laughs> about that. I, I just want to say I totally feel you because I'm also like a creator of physical theater and dance theater and I've uh, done a device piece with another Chinese uh, female artist uh, based in New York and we put part of the gymnastic practices into uh, the devising piece. Uh, when I didn't realize when I hear uh, the sound of it and I just remember every single movement and gesture of it. <laughs> it was so so long ago, like tens decades of my life before. Uh, yeah, so I've never think about it because there was another uh, girl who's from Taiwan and she just don't know anything about it. So it's kind of like a brand new thing to her. But for me, like I can, uh, another Chinese, uh, actor and we were like oh we can do this <laughs> I think it's like we learn how to uh, ride a bicycle and we can do that forever and it's just in our muscle memories I'm just really glad uh, all of you share so different perspectives of the works you, the works you have done because some are more on the language based and speaking speaking spoken language based and being a bilingual writers and some of them are more on the physical, physicality and somatic part. Uh, but I do feel all of you, like all the things you have shared, uh, the Chinese identity, like the memories of us represent a lot of things of our own culture. No matter what, like we cannot really define what is Chinese identity because the history of it or the contemporary or, or what is Chinese identity now, like no one can really say what it is. But I really feel it's all rooted in your work and rooted in your creativity, the ideas to create all of these works. And let's move on to another topic uh, because I'm also really interested in how uh, I think all of you have directed some shows and as a person from China or another country not in US, I myself have been uh, experience some brand new things or some unexpected in encounters in rehearsal room. So as a director, when you're di directing a rehearsal room, uh, what were your challenges in the rehearsal room when you were directing a show? Yeah, if you have kind of like a story or memories, maybe it's in an early time, there must be some, some kind of cultural shock in it. Yeah, if you would like to share with us about it. So maybe I can, you can, you guys can have a little more time to think about it. <laughs> like um, maybe I'll start a little bit about my experience. Um, sometimes when I just started to work in a uh, environment like this, like the words we use in theater is very different from the words we use back in China. So, uh, and my friends who was a theater major in, the, in an American college, she just didn't know anything I was talking about in Chinese. It's the same like spiking and uh, like uh, loading, load out, like all this stage left, stage right. It's something like the first thing I realized there's a, such a big difference between uh, theaters in different countries, especially like, I think, Mm, British also have different, Britain also have different vocabulary in theater. Yeah, but 
uh, it's just a very tiny anecdote of my experience. Uh, if it recall your memory of something you experienced before. I can say something like, you know, it's actually like weirdly it's in reverse because I like, I didn't learn the terminology in China ever. And so like in 2016, I, uh, I was uh, invited to direct a play for Shanghai Dramatic Arts Center. And during the rehearsal process, I couldn't find words to say to the actors because I just did not know how to say like heightened moment. I did not know how to say like, you know, do this, do that. And it was, it was quite challenging. And uh, some of the staff thought I was being pretentious, but I was like, I literally do not know the word. Can you tell me what, I can describe what it is. Um, but like, you know, in terms of the challenging uh, moments of directing in the United States is uh, like, you know, after, you know, you work um, production for a while, you will understand there, like, you know, the variety of the different union rules uh, you have to, like, you know, follow. Uh, you cannot just do a lot, of, you know, as a producer, like, I have to, I deal with union on a daily basis. So, like, you know, there are, like, a lot of rules. And then secondly, um, I would say not quite Asian actors, but a lot of um, uh, Caucasian actors, uh, particularly the ones who are a little bit more accomplished, they are very fragile. You have to be very careful in terms of what, how, like if you want to communicate effectively, you have to understand like as a, I'm talking about as a director, like and also that's me personally. I always, I never want to hurt people's feeling. Uh, as a result, I have to learn a lot about who they are and then what kind of culture they come from. Um, I mean, in, uh, sadly, like I didn't grow up in this country, so like th those, uh, those were a lot of the like you know th there were so many moments that I had to learn on the fly. And I realized, you know, it was, um, you know, words could hurt people. At the same time, like, you know, um, how how to effectively communicate what you want is very important to me. Yeah, I I, I totally feel that, like, uh, the vocabulary and also the way of being a director in Chinese theater and here is totally different. I feel. Yeah, like how, because I think in my understanding in China, most of the theater uh, institutions still have the director centered system. So everyone is following uh, the guide of the director and may not really have a chance to speak about themselves. Yeah, but here like it's a big surprise to me too, like how we have to uh, find a way to talk to everyone not only because of the language but i think language is still like very important but also like how we can really let the actors know what we really want yeah sometimes i also feel the difficulty in it yeah what about the rest of you guys do you have any experience in it yeah 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 Then, similar to chongren i also did not well i didn't do any theater directing or playwriting or either anything really in mainland China. So um, I don't know any vocabularies in theater that's in Mandarin. And in recent years, I'm actually meeting and making friends with more Chinese theater makers. And when we are having conversations about productions in Chinese, a lot of the times I have no idea what you're talking about. So I have to actually learn on the fly um, and just by translating um, through the meanings of the words and figure out what does, um, what, what do you say when you are trying to say stage manager in Chinese? Um, and then I think the cultural shock that I encountered in directing in America comes more from going into the culture of theater making from a more academic world. Um, 
because I'm very dramaturgically driven and research heavy um, as a person as well as as an artist. So I actually didn't experience much of the um, the the desire or need to. Well, I also didn't know what you're supposed to behave as a director, and going into directing. As a baby artist, I thought I was the worst person in the room. So I was trying to like listen to everybody and talk to everybody with their language. And I remember the very first directing course I took was Daniel Talbot's um, site-specific directing workshop back in 2015, summer of 2015, I think. Um, and I remember one of the best advice, I think I got two pieces of advice from that class. One is as a director, you have to become a translator and you have to speak a hundred thousand different languages. And I think I have an advantage as a foreigner who spoke a different language to begin with and had that willingness innately to understand everybody and try even harder because there is this assumption that I didn't quite understand them because I spoke a different language. And then the second one is give it all and move on. Um, so I feel like that really helped with my mental health of not taking anything personally, because I think there is some kind of philosophical difference between uh, the, the way Chinese people function as a group versus the way Western folks function as a world. I do think there is more of an erasure of self, selfness with, with Eastern culture and more of like putting the group ahead of individual, like Jiti, Da Yu Guren, right? But I think what I've encountered in Western culture, there is a little shift towards the other side, in my opinion, in these years. And I really think it's a great thing with the devised theater pieces and the fact that it's becoming less and less director centric in the way we create theater. Um, but there's a lot of the remnants of listening to the boss, you know, or, or the individualism of one person being rather more important than the rest. And that does not apply to any one person. That kind of applies as a thinking pattern or an identity. So I think that is a very uh, covert and insidious kind of culture shock that I didn't know I was going to experience. Um, and I think there has been surprising relationship that's, that's being generated from that. And then there has also been damages that's being done because of the way we, I interact with people differently than say a, a director who was born here. I, I, I hope that makes sense somehow. Thank you, Sarah. And what you have said is, yeah, you're really good in like sharing all these ideas you have, because I feel it's not only about experience and memories, uh, you also uh, created something out of that. Yeah, and I kind of want to add on one more question is like based on what have discussed. Uh, so uh, in your time working with an institution, uh, so mostly like, uh, white run institution because I I can say that most of the gatekeepers in American theater is still like white people uh, and artistic directors uh, in uh, I think I learned the research is like 90% of the artistic directors in American theaters are still like white people so ha have you ever uh, have a moment that you really want to change something about it like no matter is about the institution or the system or about yourself. Uh, yeah, is there a moment 
you have a strong awareness of that. Um, there are so many moments. Um, but then also I think there's something common about these moments. Uh, something I've been contemplating on is um, we all know the term uh, male gaze and I'm thinking about if there is a term <laughs> called uh, this is by no means to stir up any anger um, or conflict but it just re reflect a process on there's a term called western gaze uh, that's that's being um, put in uh, different kinds of white institution, white-run institutions um, in relation to the um, EDI awareness, um, um, equity, diversity, inclusion, and also coming from other culture side, the internalized Western gaze. Um, I feel something about like I share that, I share those moments Chongren and Saren shared about uh, culture shock in the other ways. And I feel my personal experience is also, I think uh, Chinese theater or Chinese theater process has its own relation to, uh, a relationship to representation. Um, and uh, that's in the creative process. And also in, um, like the, the kinds of works that we see in relation to representation of, um, you know, characters, relationships, um, and cultural representation. And I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a process that we are all learning about it. And we're, we're finding our own ways to dissect it and transform it. Um, but I think a lot of things being, um, specifically for white institution producing, sorry, a white run producing institution when and presenting institution, when they try to uh, present some works that um, allegedly um, it's a representation of um, a certain height of Chinese theater. I think there is a context that's being missed, um, the context of translating um, the work within its original context. Um, so I feel another another question about this is, so then um, what is good Chinese theater in American, according to American white run institution? Because the language um, to assess um, theater and also the experience of performance here and its re its relation to the cultural and political core is very different from other cultures taste and need um so i feel uh, i had these conversation with some of my like the uh, avant-garde theater artists in china who i really really admire and this common question has come up again and again and again is um, a lot of them are hesitate to come to US to present their works and Europe is more a popular place. This is more of a producing question, but um, then what is the gap? What is the bridge um, that could possibly bridge these gaps um, of a certain scene of Chinese work is being missing, being absent here. Has anything to do with um, the need of like justify um, the diversity that right now, uh, you know, it's it's something. Um, I don't know how to further articulate, but in the need of meeting um, diversity requirement in all these in institution, is there really like, what are some real support to support um, aesthetics and um, work diversity um, from 
China and also so many other cultures. I I just want to say I totally agree with you because the first uh the at the first time I want to create and start this festival is actually because I feel the gap between the American theater and Chinese theater. It was very interesting because uh. Uh, so I started to get into theater in, back in China, and I did not a lot, but some theater uh, works and jobs in China. And then I came here and I realized I didn't really know a lot of American theater of American plays back in China, because most of the Western play I did or I learned about is European, uh, Eurocentric plays. It's not American modern plays. That's that was a big surprise to me, actually, because in my mind, I think like Western culture in general, in a lot of Chinese people's mind, it should be American. But when you start to think more deeply about it, and actually there's no, not a lot of American plays in China or not a lot of Chinese play in America. So uh, then I, during the quarantine, I think uh, maybe the virtual, the cyberspace, uh, the virtual theater can be a way to open the door to both sides of the audience. Because I can feel the hatred uh, not only in, like, I think not only in the US, but in both of the country, it's raising up. So, and that, bec uh, I think all of this is due to the ignorance and also there's no way for the people in America and China to know each other. People cannot really see each other's work. And which I, I so I initially just wanted to start a platform and people in China, all the artists in China can perform their pieces online and people here can also know there's working works that uh, people in China, they're also doing it. And maybe it's something they have never think about because I totally agree. I always feel the stereotype uh, based expectation from the institutions to me uh, or to me as a Chinese original, originally from China uh, artist. Yeah, so, uh, so I really appreciate your sharing about your thoughts and experience in uh, the, this American institutions. Uh, I think, Yes, so uh, we have uh, interactive, uh, more fan game. So it's uh, it's about our ideal life uh, as an artist who is originally from China, but now uh, based in America or in the future also based in America. So I wanted everyone to take out a piece of paper and a pen, a pencil, or like uh, your phone anyway, that draw something to make a cocktail of your ideal artist's life. This is my very poor drawing, but <laughs> uh, you can make a cocktail. I think that's more like what we wanted to taste. So how much of uh, different things you want to pour into this bottle, like such as reality, and uh, maybe theater making and relationships with the family, with the partner, with your pet, or anything you think is worth to pour into this bottle. And yeah, I think it's just a very interesting and easier way that we can share visually what we want in our life. Maybe we don't really have it now, but uh, is something we expect to, to have in our life. Yeah, don't worry about the drawing because I feel none of you will be worse than me. So <laughs> okay. 
if you're ready, you can just maybe show it in front of the screen whenever you're ready. Can I explain it? Yes, definitely. I I like to hear every one of you to explain it. <laughs> because like my poor drawing, if I don't say it, people will, will never understand what I'm drawing. <laughs> and also I know, uh, yeah, well, you are doing this creative work and uh, I just want to say like I, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm really interested that all of you are doing interdisciplinary works. Uh, I think this is very unique because uh, as I know, uh, most of uh, the theater people actually are more uh, focusing maybe very simply in one direction. Uh, it doesn't really mean like only playwriting or directing because I feel theater people have to do a lot of things like design and uh, sometimes directing and also writing. But also I think because Xiaran uh, has been uh, doing graphic design uh, and it's very professional and also all the design is, I, I can also feel uh, a theater maker spirit in the design somehow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and also I, I know Xiao Yue uh, is also a photographer and doing a lot of photography. Yeah, it's just my research. I'm just like sharing information and interesting observations with other audience about all of you guys. <laughs> yeah, so after like I research the website and everything I can find. Yeah, I, I just feel like in person, personally, I think all of you share a very special uh, personality as an artist and also different skills uh, and talents in different genres and disciplines of art. It's a very interesting uh, phenomenon actually to me. Can I say something and possibly is a question that because I don't know if the rest of you feel this way as well but so being on an O1 visa means I can't work outside of my discipline, right? And I feel like because of that, a lot of us end up working and putting on a lot of hats, not because we genuinely love to do so many things. Because um, to be honest, every time people like say stuff like how productive I am, I feel more of a sense of pressure than pride because it's, yeah, I would love to go traveling or go get brunches every weekend as opposed to working on three projects at once. But because we don't get paid very well in the industry and we have to kind of get groceries, that's just the reality of things. But it's also very rewarding. Like I'm not complaining about doing work at all. I'm, I'm just really glad to you bring this up yeah because I I didn't really include this question in it uh, because I'm not sure like what is the uh, situation every one of you is facing because it might be different yeah so but I totally uh, agree with Ran because like the O1 visa all of us originally from China or other countries we have to obtain uh, we have to, maybe American people or American theater artists will never understand what we are experiencing. Uh, sometimes I feel the same way because I'm also struggling with a visa problem. Uh, yeah, so I think I'm just really want to do something I really like. It's a very, very simple thing to me. I also explained that to my family because I said, if I'm Sometimes I imagine because they will talk to me that back in China. So they said, why are you go coming back to China? And I will say that I just really want to do a simple thing and I can get more freedom to do it here. 
uh, I don't really hate creating arts in China or art, uh, Chinese artists, but uh, that's the truth that I can have more freedom to decide what I want to do here. But also there's a burden here too. Like Ran just said, um, it's, you just want to do a simple thing, but you have to struggling with your visa. That sounds so ridiculous to me. And you have to make so much effort to obtain it, to tell people you are a very, you, to show, to branding yourself in a way, actually, to ob obtaining the O1 visa. So in a way, I think uh, we're just experiencing a lot more than not only American theater artists, but also because I, I, I'm, I did applying for an open visa as well. And even I think Chinese artists have a more strict uh, standard to get it than any other country's artist. Yeah, which is a very strong pressure and very big burden to our creativity and our life here. So that's, uh, I will ask you about your uh, cocktail because I kind of want to see the, how do you want to make a living in that part? Oh my God, yeah, you are so professional. <laughs> wow. <laughs> do you want to share your cocktail first? Yes, we can see it, yeah. Okay, so I made a mason jar because I live in Brooklyn. Um, so this, the shell of the jar is family and other relationships. And I'm putting it on top of a coffee, Just can't live without it. And it, it consists of, oh my God, Playwriting in the foundation, directing in the torso region, and sound design on top. And then there are a few sprigs of thingies on top of there, which is traveling, long walks. Um, I like walk to Trader Joe's once a month to get a bottle of wine and baking. I have a theory about how directors would prefer baking to cooking. And that's a different conversation. You can come to my TED talk. That's I'd it. love to. <laughs> Thank you. This is such a great drawing, actually. It's a beautiful artwork. <laughs> and I, I just really love you put coffee at, at the bottom and baking on the top of it. It's like you close it and it's something you want to drink and eat. <laughs> and inside is like the spiritual uh, inspirations and ideas and creative works you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that cocktail. It's, it's so interesting. It's so fascinating. And uh, who's next? <laughs> I cannot wait to see it. Oh, hold on for a second. I have a question to you. Which part do you think is the part to support your life financially? Sorry, could you yes, repeat yes. that question? Oh, I think I'm, oh, sorry. I'm turning on the wrong view. No, I think it yeah. was just my, um, I was, yeah, it was a glitch. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's, the question is for Yan because I was seeing your image. Oh, I yeah. would make a living as a director slash baker. I can't. Okay. <laughs> I can't yeah. Be a baker right now, but if I ever end up having a green card or something, that would be a pretty nice job, a career goal. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Shaoyu, I interrupted you. Yeah, I like to see your cocktail. Oh, not a problem. I was actually just asking that question. Um, hold on. I have one more box, one more layer to add. Maybe I can go next. Yes. So, Chong and Mi Hao, uh, do you want to go first? Which one of you? It's a competition. <laughs> 
Maybe Mihal, do you want to share your cocktail first? Uh, yeah, I mean, my I can. It's kind of simple, very simple, and I, I kind of um, separated separated it into. Do you want to show us it? Show us. Show us your drawing. Practicality and um, and relationships in life and and art and art making and uh, and I've always had like I've always like struggled in in, in some in, in can I'm it may be a good struggle but I have always find it's it hard to like really separate like relationships in life which which is uh, very important to me but and also like uh your theater your art and i feel like those two um i think sometimes like the, that that kind of creates a lot of stress because it kind of your art bleeds into your life and then you can never uh, stop worrying about your art but also i feel like it's like a, a on the healthy side like the like in the the two informing each other and and so that's why like so i kind of just just like uh wow uh, <laughs> uh, 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 just in this this a pra practicality of life that's but then in the center i i think i have um, my relationships and um and my uh and and art I I think it's very interesting you bring such an interesting picture you draw it because I yeah I kind of feel especially for theater makers because we are not working in the regular working time yeah I have to say that uh, we are not living as what normal people <laughs> Turin just men mentioned uh, a life like that yeah because the working hours is different and how we do it is different so. It will be hard for us to separate our life and art making, yeah. But we have to manage it. It's hard. <laughs> and Chongyun and Xiaoyue, who want, uh, maybe Xiaoyue, I think you are preparing for it. I am ready. So, can you see? This is my cocktail. Um, there's a lot of things. So, um. They're not in order, and I put a stirring thing here, so, um, so they will always be in a mix. Um, a flight ticket to anywhere at any time is my screen mirrored. I'm not sure, uh, if, but um, I'll no, just... we can see it. It's just a little bit blurry, but you can explain it. We know where it is. Yeah. Oh, we can see it now. First layer: a flight ticket to anywhere, anytime. Uh, this has always been my dream, and especially uh, after this year of not being able to travel anywhere. And then tender, loving care from, um, and then also for my loved ones, family, and friends. Um, I think this will just be always be the core, at core of being um, a human. And then. Um, um, uninterrupted time for long duration process this is something i would always dream for my career is being able to uh, um, have a few months or even a year long time uh, not having to worry about financial uh, struggles or security and just being allowed to breathe um, in the process um, i I am always a, a fan um, for long, long process. And then um, this is going back to this was inspired by what Saran was sharing about the um, the reality of um, being here on a visa, um, a job that engages me um, with human contact in human contact. Is I've been this year. I've been longing for, uh, you know, like in at least in my childhood time, that those buses that small buses that travels in between cities and towns, they have um, someone on the bus selling ticket. I just felt that has been my dream job this entire year 
to do something has nothing to do with art, nothing to do with like, um, you know, trying to get the visa um, in in as an artist in theater. I want to do something that really just can make me be in contact with human. Um, and then this is like a mixture of a lot of things. Um, food from my childhood hometown, um, um, from mom and grandma, and then Chinese medicine. Um, also, um, un unapologetically connecting with my ancestry um, is something I strive for. And then the layer, the bottom layer is body. Um, body as, um, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Body um, is my body and also my family's body and also body as us grounding um, um, ourselves in this universe. Body in terms of health, in terms of our awareness to body and body's relation to, to the universe. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think Ran really, I, like shall we really approve that Ran's theory of <laughs> director's love making, <laughs> yeah. And I'm not a baker, so I'd like to eat what your bakery offered. <laughs> yeah, and Chongyuan. Uh. Yeah, so, uh, well, I mean, my drawing probably is worse than Tending's. I made it like, you know, sort of uh, like the pretty straightforward. Uh, the bottom 30% is relationships and family. That has always been the uh, the core and, uh, you know, the foundation of like, you know, my existence, I think. And the next level is food and travel. I think a lot of you guys um, talked about it and I'm not a baker. Like I cook a lot of dishes. I like to don't know of like, you know, what putting into it and what coming out of it. Uh, and of course, like I do love, uh, I think like, you know, being a person on this, in this world, um, traveling to different places make you understand other people better. And then it makes you a better person uh, because you know, like there are a lot of different people out there that is completely different from, you know, have a completely different experience, speak different language and uh, they think differently. This is very important to me. Um, and then like, you know, above that is my artistic work. I only put like 25%. Uh, recently, I've been like, you know, a lot of my friends starting, I don't have a therapist, but like, you know, I have a lot of uh, personal, like, you know, I have like, I feel like I need to take care of myself more. So like, and I put in only 25%. Um, and I think like, and it actually makes me more productive um, that way. Um, and another part of the big artistic work uh, is, um, I want to say like, you know, when, um, in, in fact, a lot of the artistic directors in the United States are like, you know, uh, you know, for Yancey, uh, we are small enough. So like, I'm still doing a lot of hands-on uh, programming work, but for a lot of the big institutions, artistic directors are not in charge of artistic side. They are the fundraisers. So like, you know, you have to understand that's why majority of them are white, uh, old white men, because they can talk to people, get the money. I mean, it's, uh, it's a much different world um, compared to like, you know, this running a smaller company and you're very hands-on. And because I know a lot of the artists are struggling out there, like, you know, a big part of me uh, in the next couple of years is really trying to figure out how to uh, get more money and pay our artists better. Like, you know, I always pay people, like, you know, the more, uh, you know, the, the more we get, the more I can offer. And that's very important to me. That's like a big part of the, my goal. And then uh, on top of it, I want to leave 25% uh, empty um, because I feel like, you know, I always don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. Weirdly, I start drawing this bottle. I started like, you know, uh, from the top. Uh, I realized, you know, I actually put a top on it and it looks like a cocktail shaker. And I realized, you know, because like, you know, we put in all those ingredients and you always shake it up together. So it's not really, you know, that much like in this percentage, that percentage. Um, and also like, you know, uh, I think like I'm not really an astrology person, but I 
but I'm an Aquarius and I always feel like you know, there's something like up here. <laughs> I always put it like, you know, it, it, you have to like go dig deep into it and then you see like, you know, uh, what I've been thinking. I'm trying to understand myself better, like, you know, and uh, through the work we do and through these kind of opportunities to meet uh, people. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> that's it. It is such an interesting activity, actually. I've never done this before, but it was so great to see a lot of personal, uh, very intimate part of every one of you. Yeah, and I really admire the responsibility uh, Chongren shared to pay artists and theater makers better because we, I believe all of us or theater makers in the whole world, most of the theater makers are not getting paid very uh, generously or even correctly in a way because we have done so much work. And uh, so there have to be people who uh, ha have to take the responsibility to try to make theater makers life better. Yeah, but it's a big question and it's, it's a big, it's a long way, long journey to go. Yeah, but I'm really happy uh, Chongren bring this up to everyone in front of a screen who is watching it too. Yeah, so uh, I think we're, uh, we, it's already 8.50 and uh, I do have a lot of more questions. Uh, some of them I prepared and some of them is just come from our discussions and all the things you are sharing. But I think I think the theaters or everything in the US in New York is opening soon. So I'm really looking forward to meet every one of you in person and maybe we can have a baker director, <laughs> cooking director a club <laughs> in person in reality. Yeah. So uh, I'm just really appreciate every one of you attending this opening panel for Bound 2021. And also there's uh, more like eight shows will go online one after another uh, on YouTube, Twitch, in the overseas platforms and uh, Bilibili and uh, Xinlang Xinwen and uh, what's the other one? Uh, uh, like some three main uh, primary platforms back in China. Uh, and all the shows will be both in Chinese and English subtitles. And some of them, the language is Chinese and some of them are in English. Uh, so we'll share more information on our website and our social media in San Facebook and also the Chinese WeChat. So uh, yeah, just I also wanted to in, invite all of you to come to see it uh, online. Thank you everyone and hope to meet every one of you in person. Have a good night. Thank you.